Good day, everybody. My name is Martin Shainin, and I'm a British Academy Global Professor at the Bonavero Institute. The theme of today's Bonavero discussion group is automated decision making and its impact on human rights in a time of COVID-19. I'd like to introduce our speaker and our discussant. Eliska Pirkova works at the civil society organization Access Now, where she leads European work on content governance and the protection of freedom of expression online. She's a human rights lawyer pursuing her PhD. She works in respect of the EU, Council of Europe and OSCE frameworks, as well as across the public-private divide in issues of online content governance and its impact upon freedom of expression. She has been closely following the adoption of the EU regulation on terrorist online content. Currently, I have the pleasure of working with her uh, in an OSCE expert working group on the impact of artificial intelligence on freedom of expression with a particular focus, focus on security. She will uh, be the presenter today. The commentator, Matthias Vermeulen, is someone with whom I have collaborated for more than a decade, including in three EU-funded research projects, Detector, Surprise and Surveil, that all looked into the human rights consequences of using surveillance technology, primarily in the prevention of terrorism or other crime. Before that, Matthias was assisting the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism during my term, including in the drafting of the reports on privacy rights and intelligence oversight and in uh, conducting country visits to Egypt and Tunisia. His PhD thesis was on privacy in the public space. And today he works as public policy director at the data rights agency AWO. As our frequent participants know, the format of our session is that Eliska will give a presentation of the theme, whereafter Matthias will present his comments and then Eliska will respond. People in the audience will present their question using the Q&A function at any point of time starting now. And I will do then my best to cluster the questions uh, and present them to Eliska. In the final round, at least, Matthias will also get the word before we close. Please, Eliska, happy to have you here, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, so thank you very much again for inviting me. Before I will go into my presentation, I just would like to quickly introduce the organization that I work for, which is uh, Access Now. It's a global human rights organization that extends and defends human rights of online users at risk around the globe. We work on various policy and legal issues surrounding digital rights from right to freedom of expression and content governance that we will discuss today, as well as data protection, privacy or cybersecurity. And I specifically lead our European work on content governance related issues, including very uh, hot topics such as Digital Services Act proposal or now adopted online terrorist content regulation that Martin has already mentioned at the beginning. And today I will be discussing the impact of uh, automated content moderation tools or algorithmic content moderation tools, or tools on human rights and why human rights experts should actually pay more and more attention to these prevailing ongoing issue, which is becoming bigger and bigger. And as recent uh, developments around the globe, whether in Palestine or in other parts of the world are showing how much impact certain actors that we often refer to as gatekeepers of fundamental rights or very large online platforms, which is more a term used by the European legislator at the moment, have the power and ability to shape the public discourse. And perhaps the reasons and the uh, calls for uh, regulating these platforms um, out of necessity might be justified. Um, I will now start my presentation and I will try to share my screen with you. Um, I have a few PowerPoints prepared. Uh, 
uh, as an introduction uh, because I believe that it will be perhaps easier for you to follow. Um, and even though um, and today is uh, the main topic is actually to speak about the uh, content moderation or algorithmic content uh, moderation in the context of COVID-19, I will dare to step out from these uh, margins uh, because if anything, the global uh, pandemic showed that these issues that existed already before the global uh, pandemic of COVID-19 became even more uh, pertinent and more visible and we became even more aware uh, what these automated tools can do or how far-reaching impact they can have on fundamental rights and freedoms of online users. And I think that recent developments around the globe are very, uh, very telling in that regard. And I would like to perhaps just shed the light on those that happened in last two weeks or even in, in more recent days. And the first one is uh, definitely the issue surrounding uh, what's currently happening in uh, Israel and Palestine uh, and how uh, very large social media platforms were actually dealing with the user generated content directly linked to the ongoing conflict. Um, and especially uh, in relation to margin marginalized groups uh, or minority groups uh, that are often, even though uh, they are supposed to be protected by these tools, they are often on the receiving end of, end of human rights abuse. We saw massive amount of takedowns happening in connection to um, uh, neighborhoods in Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, the hashtag Save Sheikh Jarrah, but also hashtags uh, that are more connected to the ongoing conflicts and around uh, uh, Palestine movements and uh, situation in Gaza. Uh, we've been witnessing uh, the certain form of censorships around marginalized group before, and here probably it's also important to underline that access now is also running digital security helpline, which is precisely here to actually provide assistance to human rights defenders, activists, and other users at risk. And our helpline actually monitors these cases since we are being directly contacted about often illegitimate take takedowns or blocking of accounts of individual users. So that's one example where many uh, observe, uh, observers and experts around the globe now speak not only about online censorship, but online repression. Um, another example, if we move away from the context of Palestine, which was uh, interestingly happening around the same time, is the uh, movement in Canada, the indigenous women movement, and a so-called Red Dress Day, uh, which I believe takes place on 6th of May, when, uh, which is the day when uh, activists want to uh, turn attention of the world to the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, which is an undergoing issue, which is not being properly addressed by public authorities as it should be. And suddenly the content related um, uh, to this hashtag or uh, to these uh, days that started be removed from Instagram and other accounts and other social media platforms as well. Uh, here is just a very quick screenshot I took when these things were happening. Uh, for you to see, uh, but these sort of messages were popping up and appearing all around Instagram, which was the main platform where, where this type of content was actually taken down. Now, uh, the official explanation of private companies is often the technical glitch. It's a technical difficulty that we are working on and we are very sorry. There is no political or other motivation behind this, but uh, since we are monitoring this situation and being a global organization uh, and due to the lack of public scrutiny and meaningful transparency within the operations these platforms deploy on a regular basis um, and then ultimately the negative consequences they have on uh, users human rights and their participation in public discourse making specifically marginalized communities often voiceless uh, technical glitch is for us gradually more and more rather achieve excuse or a quick explanation. And today presentations will explain in further details why this is the case. I will now stop sharing the screen um, uh, because that's pretty much all I wanted to quickly show you and move to the concrete points. So first I will start with how AI actually, um, or AI tools or often machine learning system or al algorithmic content moderation uh, is being used by these platforms. So, and what for what purpose? The most regular use is uh, definitely the proactive detection of the content, whether potentially illegal content or the content that actually violates terms of 
service of these platforms and also for automated evaluation of such a content. So whether the content indeed violates some rule within the terms of service. And maybe just to quickly specify, today I mainly focus on the very large online platforms or online gatekeepers while leaving the smaller platforms or smaller players and services outside of the scope of this presentation. Um, so AI tools might be used in the detection of potentially problematic posts. Uh, uh, and when this detection uh, happens, this is also in order to reduce the reliance on so-called reactive content moderation. And by reactive content moderation, we mean uh, content mo moderation that heavily relies on users or occasionally public authorities or uh, courts to actually flag content for their review. Uh, and uh, consequently, these tools may be also enforced for um, uh, the actual decision making, whether the content truly violate the content policy or uh, the law. And if that's the case, then the content in question will be automatically removed or demoted from the platform. Now, uh, very often we encounter the term AI tools, so artificial intelligence tools. This is at the moment also widely term, uh, widely used term uh, uh, by the policymakers and international organizations. I just would like to caution everyone that many of the content content recognition or content detection tools hardly amount to the artificial intelligent tools and they are usually algorithms or machine learning based systems that are prone to errors uh, and we will talk about that in a minute. Uh, if you take a look at the European language used in the context of content moderation, you come across various terminology that often finds its way to concrete legislative proposals. One is, for instance, monitoring obligation for platforms. Uh, so uh, currently under e-commerce directive, which is the main legal framework still, the main legal framework governing the intermediary liability regime in the EU, we hear uh, there is uh, the, the prohibition of general monitoring of user-generated content, which is fortunately a provision which has been now also transposed to Digital Services Act. Then uh, you will often hear discussions around notice and stay down, so notice and action procedures. Uh, uh, very often uh, we discuss the issue around upload filtering and upload filters. That was the term widely used, especially during the copyright debate. Uh, automatic detection or removal of the content, and then lately very generic term of proactive measures uh, has been used by the EU legislature as well and that was specifically in the context of already mentioned online terrorist content regulation. Now, proactive methods deployed by platforms uh, are very special animal in the world of content moderation. Uh, they often include manual techniques, that means holding a post in a queue for a human evaluation prior, prior its publication. Uh, and it also includes automated systems that use filters or that evaluate network level signals such as IP addresses and posting behavior in order to preemptively block spam malware on the or the particular type of the content they are supposed to target. So this is a quick introduction into the content moderation world and uh, where we actually tend when it comes where we actually stand when it comes to technical uh, specificities. Now I would like to look uh, concretely into what is the negative impact on fundamental rights and freedoms that these technologies ultimately carry within. And I would start with prior restraints on the right to freedom of expression and opinion. So also sometimes called prior censorship. As you all know, and I definitely don't have to explain that to this audience, uh, the limitations on the right freedom of expression or the legitimate lim uh, limitation on the right to freedom of expression as uh, specified by the international human rights law must be provided by law. They have to have, they have to be pursuant to a legitimate aim. They must be necessary and proportionate. And these measures that are supposed to achieve that aim has to be necessary and proportionate. So what we mean by prior censorship, even if we just generally take uh, this term and forget for a moment about the online context, uh, prior censorship refers to circumstances where a speaker must seek some level of approval uh, from an uh, empowered third party. Um, and when it's the state, for instance, that exercises the censorship, it has to be some public authority uh, before they are actually allowed to speak or that, to publish their views. 
and uh, prior censorship can be in the direct violation with the international human rights framework uh, for the following reasons. Uh, first of all, it can create a system of um, uh, where too much speech is actually being brought into the scope of government control and government review. Um, as we know, based on the practical experience and what we have witnessed many times, when censorship becomes convenient, it becomes way too common. And finally, such systems are completely shielded from public scrutiny about what rules govern actually speech and how they are being applied. And this is extremely essential argument, especially for the online regulation of free flow of expression. I very much like a Professor Bar Balkin term, and he uses the term of deliberate overbreadth of coverage, where he uh, basically explains that prior restraints subject a much greater breadth and variety of content to government scrutiny and surveillance than a system of subsequent prosecution and punishment. So what does this mean in practice? Uh, there is a number internet intermediaries, which is this umbrella term for different types of platforms of different sizes and shapes that actually uh, copied, processed and stored uh, the content that we share. And if these intermediaries apply filters to all content uh, within the multiple layers to each conversation, um, and uh, each conversation is subjected to some form of a third party private actor pre-approval, uh, these techniques ultimately are deeply intrusive for our human rights, deeply intrusive not only for right to freedom of expression and opinion, but equally to right to privacy and data protection. Now, my second point about negative impact on fundamental rights has a lot to do with the lack of procedural safeguards in online space. So why the procedural safeguards are important? And again, if we take them out of the realm of online space, Procedural safeguards are here, uh, for instance, such as right to appeal against the decision that is being made, uh, are here to introduce the, the friction uh, into the system of adjudicating uh, the illegality of speech. Uh, however, when we heavily rely on automated tools and measures, which can contain, consist of, for instance, natural, natural language processing that will specifically focus on certain keywords, or if we discuss then content which is more graphics so or pictures or video uh, that's usually being regulated through so-called hash matching filters or hash databases. All of these are, are first of all vulnerable to overbroad application. Uh, they operate on the basis of very vaguely defined uh, rules that are not being satisfactorily explained and exposed to a users. And most importantly, they are context blind. That means they are not able to actually specifically or concretely assess the details of the context of the expression. And as a result of that, they make mistakes uh, in the matching that they ultimately are supposed to generate. And these mistakes, that's exactly what we refer to as false positives and false negatives, which in practice means or they will miss the content they are supposed to target altogether, or on the other hand, they will actually target the content which is completely legitimate. So when the courts actually decides on uh, free expression uh, issues on case by case basis, rather than through uh, some quickly administer systems of prior censorship and filtering, uh, you as a user and you as a right holder is able to make argument to independent judicial oversight in ideal world and under ideal circumstances that will then govern the standards uh, that were uh, uh, wrongly applied at first place. And this, of course, is happen, uh, confirmed by a large jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, for instance, by the famous case of Yildirim versus Turkey, where speakers must be able to appeal restrictions on their freedom of expression to an independent arbiter. This is not guaranteed in, in any way at the moment within the online space. And that argument is very much connected to my final argument on the negative impact that these tools may have on human rights. And that's the so-called, and again, to use Professor Balkin term, law visibility systems of control. So a system of these prior restraints of freedom of expression 
directly contradict the international human rights framework, which clearly establishes that the limitations on expression must be provided by law, and these rules must be then formulated with sufficient precision to enable an individual to regulate their conduct. So people have simply the right to complete, to, to understand clearly what rules apply to them and to their expression. And this is then enshrined within the principle of legal certainty and legal predictability. What we all see uh, when we analyze the terms of service or community standards, very large online platform, we encounter a vagueness of rules and these standards. Uh, so it's not absolutely clear uh, and reasonable for a person to then understand what rules actually govern their speech um, and how then can they adjust their uh, behavior in order to avoid uh, uh, consequences, repercussion and punishments. Uh, so uh, that's a major issue. And another issue here is the for instance, community standards tend to change a lot, uh, quite regular basis. And uh, even though platforms are progressing and trying to comply with some of our demands, very often a user is not being sufficiently informed about the subsequent changes within the terms of service. The language is still very difficult. And this has a lot to do also with the design, the interface the design platforms are using, whether uh, these are different nudging techniques and dark patterns, which paradoxically be also used for a positive outcome, which we have see still very little. And my final point, why this is so extremely problematic for human rights uh, protection, uh, just to actually quickly summarize this, it's the scale. So uh, it's scale and moderation at scale is basically defining characteristic of online communication of our time because it happens at a massive scale and in reality intermediaries often don't have any other options or choice uh, in order to actually handle that waste amount of user generated content that is being shared on their platforms they need to deploy automated tools for content moderation and content curation it can be also very difficult for a human, uh, since we often emphasize the, the importance of human in the loop that can actually properly uh, then assess the content and decide uh, whether that violates the terms of service. Um, but still, it can be very difficult to manage uh, this task, um, especially when the waste amount of content is being regularly collected and forwarded to platforms. And something as such as abusive notice is in the reality. So uh, in order to actually respond to the relatively unimaginable scale of content, uh, they had to actually develop the reactive content moderation, which I have already mentioned. That means that they, uh, there are some instances when a platform will actually react only the damage is already done. So um, I would then uh, move to my concluding remarks, which also uh, touch on the recent developments at the EU level and maybe possibility of uh, starting the platform governance from the scratch or not completely from the scratch, but having this new generation of laws and regulations that can actually approach this issue from a bit different angle. Um, we can conclude that the current regulatory responses that we witnessed in the recent years, whether at the member states level or at the EU level, so the regulatory responses that try to tackle concrete uh, uh, category of illegal conduct or illegal conduct online, often promoting silver bullet solutions or very short-sighted solutions relying on swift content removals, which only intensify the use of automated uh, tools under a very short time frames is simply not working. We also see that based on the recent developments, whether those that I've already mentioned, but even if we consider very recent uh, deplatforming of former President Trump and Facebook oversight board decision, uh, that relying heavily on platforms to actually take the responsibility away from the state is not exactly the right way either. And we end up in this vicious circle where we just keep repeating the same mistakes. However, uh, the European Union is currently preparing a new legislation, so-called Digital Services Act proposal, together with Digital Market Act proposal, which is also equally important, uh, that instead of focusing 
on purely sectoral issues and uh, the concrete categories of content. It focuses on the processes and operations that these platforms deploy on everyday basis and have the power to shape the public discourse. Uh, these processes include issues such as transparency or accountability, but also trying to mitigate the risk that is stemming from these systems that we discussed today before the actual damage is done. Now we can discuss how well those provisions are being designed. Um, uh, we tend to say about DSA that it's a great start, which is still full out of uh, imperfections, but we are also at the beginning of the journey and we will have plenty of time to actually tune the legislation uh, also with your help. So um, if uh, the current model is not working, uh, we need the solutions how to actually empower users and how to especially empower marginalized communities. Um, I will probably stop here for now and uh, I am very much looking forward to Matthias response and to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eliska. Uh, we have heard the introduction, and I turn to the commentator, Matthias Vermeulen. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, and thank you as well, Eliska, for uh, that wonderful talk. And it's wonderful to be here, and I'm really looking forward to discuss, discuss these issues uh, with you. Now, sort of the problem that I'm faced with a little bit now is that I usually agree with Eliska on many of these topics. But since the sentence, um, I agree with everything, wouldn't really fill a 15 minute uh, time slot as a, as a commentator. Um, I think I want, to, I want to start with offering some high level critical remarks about uh, the starting premise that I often encounter in the debates around the Digital Services Act. Um, and that is, and it also under, underlines a little bit some of the arguments that Eliska just has made, um, which I, to be honest, like, fully agree with. Um, but that is the idea that international human rights norms are sometimes seen as a sort of panacea for many of the problems related to online speech regulation. And sometimes I hear statements like, for instance, if companies would just adhere to international human rights norms or even inscribe them in their terms of services, then we would, but we would all end up in a much better place and all of our online content governance problems we're faced with would magically be solved. So what I would like to do here is to highlight upfront some of the limits that international human rights law has in addressing some of these very thorny online content governance problems uh, we have. And uh, just like Evelyn, Evelyn Dueck from Harvard, whose um, uh, earlier writings have really influenced most of the points I'm, I'm going to make, I think it is crucial that we need to be, and it, we need to be very explicit about the limits of international human rights law. And I think we need to be explicit about these limits for two main reasons. The first one is that if we don't take these seriously and treat international human, human rights law principles as a panacea, we will be bound to be disappointed when it turns out that we'll still end up with many of the same or similar uh, thorny problems that, we, that we're faced with right now. And I think secondly, and even more importantly, I think because um, failing to acknowledge these limits will only serve the interests of the platforms rather than their users. And that is, I think, because in practice, I fear that adopting international human rights law standard as the basis of content moderation decisions would not constrain the operations of these platforms to any significant extent right now, despite all the societal problems in relation to hate speech, electoral interference, doxing, and, and so on. And I think we need to be crystal clear that international human rights law would still give an awful lot of agency and choice to private actors who could simply assert that they are quote unquote applying international human rights law to arrive at the very same decisions that they currently make in the content moderation space. Now, I want to assess from the outside that this is a, a very sympathetic critique which I see sort of as the equivalent of uh, a practice known from the cybersecurity field known as, as red teaming, where one team challenges some of the assumptions of the other team, which I hugely support, Elishka's team, by adopting a sort of more adversarial uh, approach. And that's, I think, in a sense, how I would want to um, uh, respond to some of Elishka's uh, points as well. 
And so my first argument related to the, uh, the limits of international human rights law in this context is that it gives very little substantive guidance as to what the outcome should actually be of most content moderation decisions. I think it's pretty clear that human rights law imposes very clear red lines on extreme edge cases. For instance, according to international human rights law standards, incitement to genocide, for instance, should not be allowed on these platforms, for example. But it's exactly in the, in the harder, or depending on your perspective, like the more mundane cases, where reasonable minds can differ about the appropriate, and I know this is a term that uh, Professor Shining doesn't really like, the appropriate balancing exercise between different rights, such as speech and privacy, for instance, that platforms are actually in need of, of guidance. And it's exactly in those more mundane cases that international human rights law doesn't give that guidance that is so sorely needed right now. Plus, I think on top of this, states disagree about the appropriate calibration of those decisions as well. And you see that, for instance, and still in the high amount of reservations to the uh, freedom of expression provisions in uh, international treaties. But more generally, I think this, this observation strengthens the point that Eliska also has already made which I think that speech decisions, even among the most mature democracies, are always highly contextual and need to take account local norms and facts. And so looking into international human rights law as a source of guidance is, I think, a decision to preserve the status quo in terms of what platforms should or shouldn't be able to do in, in the first place. And I think this is also um, one of the lessons learned um, related to, you might want to call it like the naivete of the early days of the platforms era, where it was sometimes argued that the mere existence of platforms contributed to the promotion of freedom of speech. And I think the sort of uh, the platforms unite, unidimensional US focused understanding of free expression and their failure to adjust to local contexts like the ones in Israel and Palestine that um, uh, Eliska also just mentioned, has been one of the reasons why we are currently in this current content moderation uh, mess, frankly, that we, are, that we are currently in. And so while slightly provocatively, I, I don't think that international human rights law perhaps has as much added value to bring in terms of the substantive rules that can guide content-related decisions compared to what some advocates would like it to have. I also think it's, it's sort of its procedural obligations aren't necessarily very clear or handy. And this also uh, relates to, uh, I think, Eliska's second point that she has made related to the sort of more procedural obligations um, that are important to discuss in this, um, in this, uh, in this context. And so that is my, my second observation. And I would want to make two, two uh, points in, in this context. I think some human rights lawyers would indeed argue that due process requirements of Article 19, for instance, should be interpreted as requiring an individualized determination by an independent arbiter on a case-by-case -case basis. But like Eliska has already said, the scale of content moderation cases as such make such individualized assessment just impossible. Like yesterday, for instance, I was just looking at uh, Facebook's content moderation decisions on hate speech, just the amount of decisions it had to make in the first quarter of 2021, and they took content moderation decisions on 26.9 million pieces of content, only focusing on hate speech. Now, my question is like, which judicial system can accommodate that amount of individual status determinations at, at this point? And then my second sub point is that if that isn't your default starting point, and you agree that like, well, this sort of content moderation at scale makes these independent um, deter determinations impossible. Uh, but instead, you argue, like Eliska also does, for instance, that it's the, the due process aspects of freedom of speech would require platforms to sort of simply, to a certain extent, have clear, precise, and transparent statements about how they are making their content moderation decisions in the first place so the, you, the user can um, change his or her behavior accordingly. Well, then I would argue that the three-pronged test of Article 19, for instance, is a useful framework, but there's nothing inherently unique about this test as well, which also comes back, for instance, in most of the risk assessment uh, 
frameworks as well, like, for instance, what we are seeing now being proposed by the European Union in the Digital uh, Services Act, which doesn't talk about a mandatory human rights pact impact assessment, but which talks about a mandatory risk assessment approach that focuses exactly on the need for more transparency um, uh, in order to arrive at that at, at the sort of more uh, clarity relating to the rules that are uh, uh, entering into that are relevant. And then I think my third point related to the uh, the limits of of human rights law, and this is actually my main argument, would be that the uh, the platform era requires actually a paradigm shift in thinking about rights from individual individualistic to systemic. And I think international human rights law has not yet fully developed the, the jurisprudence or the tools to deal with this fundamental change. And I think this, com this sort of discussion on the need of collective rights comes back in the sort of content governance debates, but it's also very much front and center in the debates related to the limits of, of GDPR. Um, and I think it's, it's also linked to my second point uh, to a certain extent in the fact that I think we need indeed these sort of scalable solutions and such scalable solutions not only practically require a more systemic view of, of rights as opposed to an, a merely an individualist, individualistic one, but they also provide a more, um, let's say nuanced lens through which we could view some of, the, of our most pro, um, pressing problems in this content governance uh, space. And then I'm thinking specifically, and, and Eliska already hinted at that as well, that some of the harms of our current online uh, media ecosystem are disproportionately experienced by historically marginalized groups who are often the primary targets of online harassment, abuse, and hate speech. And now it's commonly argued that mitigating these abusive practices um, presents a challenge to freedom of expression and could lead to, to censorship. And I agree to a certain extent with, with that claim. And that's, of course, the whole discussion on legal but harmful, harmful content that we're having, not only in the EU, but also in, in the UK very much. But I think like many of those advocates, they, they forget that such a chilling effect claim are usually advanced to, um, to oppose measures taken to, to curb online harassment or abuse but they tend to neglect other kinds of chilling effects, in particular, how such abuse actually chills the freedom of expression and access to information of the targets of those uh, campaigns, whose voices have been typically um, uh, marginalized. And so if we agree that this is a problem and that, quote unquote, something should be done to tackle these specific forms of, of hate speech against specific groups, should the platform then err on the side of over-enforcing or under-enforcing its policy against hate speech, for instance, acknowledging that while the former would perhaps like a precautionary approach to protect marginalized communities, it's also at odds with basically what Eliska has, has just singled out, with this more traditional thinking about freedom of expression that generally errs on the side of giving free speech um, a lot of breathing space, uh, breathing space actually. And so I think I'll leave it at that right now. Um, basically, like this was deliberately a slightly more provocative view because usually I agree with everything that uh, Eliska has been saying. And I do agree with all the danger that she has highlighted in the use of automated tools to detect um, um, uh, specific harmful pieces of, of content. But uh, to make this debate a bit more interesting and lively, I thought like I'd share some of these reservations uh, with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matthias. Interesting comments. And we give Eliska a chance to respond before turning to the Q&A. Thank you very much. And thank you, Matthias. These are excellent remarks. Um, and also many, many things were mentioned that should be unpacked. And I, and I don't think I, <laughs> I will be able to touch up on every single one you raised. Um, I definitely see everything that you raised and probably indeed in many ways I would also um, agree with you and and so I'm gonna try to answer it in some kind of systemic manner and I took the notes um, so 
Um, I agree with you, obviously, that and there are many many ideas about how to actually divide the, the evolution of internet into different historical uh, eras. Um, and of course, there was this initial idea, which I think partially still can have some vitality. And uh, we also see it and something that I did not mention uh, during my presentation is that uh, very often the content that is being taken down by platforms can also serve as a documentation of human rights abuse and human rights violations, especially in areas where uh, free press doesn't have such an easy access or it's quiet or the, the content or there are too many internet shutdowns uh, imposed by state often to prevent the free flow of information whether to country or outside the country. Um, so um, we also see that, especially in this part of the world, which is more touching upon the issue of enforcement of these measures that you were rightly pointing out to, um, platforms are actually the only source of how to share this information, how to participate in public discourse, and also how to sometimes gain some level of justice when actually it's the state who is the main perpetrator of human rights abuse. Uh, and that's the case in many parts of the world, unfortunately. Um, so I would say that all three elements within the platform governance, whether it's a state regulation, uh, self-regulation, and to some extent court regulation as well, uh, has its significant role. And I think all of them, to be very honest, can be informed by international human rights framework. And let's not forget that we also have something called United Nations Guiding Principle on Human Rights. And now we can discuss how relevant or how these principles could be perhaps developed further also to respond to the reality of these strange animals that gatekeepers of fundamental rights fundamentally are and 10 years ago we were not completely aware of what is actually currently what was created and what we are now witnessing that level of dominance and impact they can possibly have um so i would then probably touch upon the issue of risk assessment when we actually, uh, so the comment that you raised around uh, the mandatory human rights impact assessment and it's probably, it comes as no surprise that this is exactly what Access Now has been advocating for for a very long time. So ex ante human rights impact assessments that should be mandatory on platforms and with the sufficient public oversight. We do realize there are plenty of difficulties in this system that will have to be acknowledged. This is the model that was proposed by GDPR framework. We see uh, now also uh, the uh, artificial intelligence regulation in looking at the EU level, um, putting actually more emphasis on the actual risk assessment model and the DSA, the Digital Services Act proposal does precisely the same. So when you compare these three, you can clearly see that there is a very similar approach being actually, uh, you know, envisioned by all three, uh, one regulation and other two proposed regulations. We are very much wary of this system uh, and I will now touch, up, touch upon the issue of DSA. I do understand and I hear your argument about how also some terminology within international human rights law might be relatively abstract to be actually implemented and measured and assessed for a platform. But that's the precisely idea uh, and kind of one of the shortcomings of DSA where way too much self-assessment is being left in hands of online platforms. And uh, within the risk assessment measure as it's currently being envisioned by this regulation is that the, the platforms will be obliged to, to actually act only if they themselves assess that there is a systemic risk stemming from their operation. And indeed, within the DSA, human rights impact assessment is being hinted to under Article 26.B, I believe, but it's not enough. And it's certainly not a primary tool for how to actually mitigate those risks that we discussed today that ultimately stem from their operations. I do not also like the, and we discussed that many times, this co-regulatory mechanism where the mitigation of risk measures will be very much happening through regulatory backsteps that will be within the voluntary code of practices and code of conducts, um, which are some of them already created by the European Commission, such as the one against illegal online hate speech or code on, uh, of practice on disinformation. Uh, this carrot and stick policy, meaning if you fulfill these criteria voluntarily, we will keep our regulatory scrutiny in bay, was not exactly working in the past. And we have a hard time to believe how that would actually work now when it 
when it will be, you know, uh, like uh, the part of the legally binding regulatory framework. I don't have a good answer what system could actually work. I don't know yet at this point whether risk assessment can actually deliver some sort of remedy, especially to those victims coming from historically marginalized groups. This is something that we will have to explore further, but I still think that mitigation of risk measures might have their place, but it should be secondary place in contrast to human rights impact assessments, where the public scrutiny can be actually enforced in contrast to the currently, uh, or to the mitigation of risk measures in a way as they are being designed at the moment. Now, um, you mentioned the judicial systems, how much they wouldn't be able to actually deal with uh, the number of complaints that would be actually coming their way um, and how this is definitely a shortcoming. And I can only agree. Uh, we often promote judicial uh, independent oversight as the high standard and saying that it should always be available to online users. DSA also envision other ways how to actually achieve effective remedy uh, from the different uh, dispute settlement and non-judicial dispute settlement and uh, right to appeal at the platform level. And so does actually the Council of Europe recommendation on um, uh, responsibilities of internet intermediaries, um, where that one actually envisions several layers of how user can actually obtain some level of satisfactory remedy. So I think there are many ideas of that are currently floating in the air and it's very important that they will be legally formalized and we will get them right um, but I agree that the uh, judicial system could certainly not handle that amount and we need to somehow engage the platforms but we also need to make sure that they are being subjected to that public scrutiny that I keep repeating all over again um, because at the moment um, uh, that is not happening and we don't even know how often people do appeal decisions that the platform makes, how these decisions were made, whether it was made by automated tools, whether human moderators saw that piece of content. It's also very important to actually disclose how much time content moderators spent on assessing the content and how much time they take uh, on assessing the appeal against such a decision, counter notices for content providers and so on and so forth. These are procedural safeguards that can be implemented by platforms and should be. And um, I think they are very much fully aware of these requirements for meaningful transparency and accountability. And to this day, uh, transparency is just some form of generosity that they occasionally express when they're being pushed by the regulators to do so. Uh, and we are still, still not getting important or the, the, the overall picture that we need in order to achieve evidence-based decision-making. Um, and uh, But I don't have to explain that to you, Matthias, because you know that more, more than well. And then the data access framework is definitely an important aspect, and I know that you're the expert on that topic, and DSA actually does establish data access framework. At the moment, mainly for vetted researchers, we would like to see that to be um, uh, the, the scope to be uh, to include also the civil society organizations with the relevant expertise uh, and other independent stakeholders that should be able to do that. And then there is the whole issue of auditing of platforms, right, and independent audits that can actually play important role uh, for how to establish again that that scrutiny um, uh, especially in connection to the terms of service of platforms for instance so um, I think there are still many issues that if international human rights framework certainly can and should inform um, but I see your point and I definitely agree um, then the collective aspect and the, um, the nuanced lens for the content government governance. Um, and, uh, and then I will touch quickly on how freedom of expression of marginalized group and how that argument is actually being used by different sides. And then I'll stop there. Um, so on the uh, collective aspect, uh, we would be actually very glad to see and we currently don't have that. And by we, I mean, now representing more the civil society angle here. Um, we would certainly love to see, for instance, the possibility of collective redress being included in the scope of the ESA. 
um, also similarly to what we see under the GDPR framework. Uh, we didn't get that in the current draft at the moment, but we are hoping that these things can still be changed because that could be definitely, at least to some extent, a game changer for the historically marginalized groups. Uh, where actually uh, civil society that have that expertise and experience with strategic litigation could actually help them to fight these cases. Um, and uh, I would also say that uh, we didn't really touch upon this issue today, but ultimately I have to speak a little about business models when we speak about silencing of marginalized group or amplification of online hate speech or these potentially harmful but legal, uh, very uh, vague category of the content um, yeah, that if not being, uh, you know, uh, if it's included in the legislative or legally binding framework, it can also potentially cost more harm than good uh, and that's why we put the emphasis on the processes um, but um, I, I think that it's definitely about also how this content is being curated not only how it's being moderated which is inherent issue within the business model structure and fabric of these platforms um, and then we touch upon the issue of the content recommender systems which are also currently being uh, included in the framework and the scope of digital services act um, and how actually that can be influenced even beyond the pure transparency requirements, which is now where uh, DSA puts the biggest emphasis, but we believe that we could go even further than that. Um, so I'll stop there. I, I'm sure that I missed half of your excellent points, uh, but thank you very much for being here today and uh, for a great debate. Thank you, Eliska, for the responses. Matthias will have a chance still during this session to take issues further. We have three questions in the Q&A from the same person. I encourage others to post their questions in the Q&A. And I start with my own question because it's about the, the scope of the presentation and the scope of our discussion we had in the title in the time of COVID-19, Eliska. <laughs> um, how do you relate your presentation to the time of COVID? Because there's a lot of artificial intelligence, automated decision-making in relation to various measures uh, in times of COVID, which could relate to immunity passports, could relate to contact tracing or proximity detection, could relate even to staggered measures based on artificial intelligence-based decision-making regionally. But in light of the scope of your presentation, your interest is in content moderation in time of COVID. And I think there are two specific factors then where I would like to hear from you. One of them is that about 10% of the countries in the world officially derogated from human rights treaties and freedom of expression is a derogable right. And I guess about 20, 30% of countries in the world derogated from their own laws, constitutions, but not officially from international human rights treaties. So we have, a, we have a need to include the question of state of emergency in the discussion on content moderation because of time of COVID. And the second point is uh, disinformation. You didn't touch much upon the question of disinformation as part of content moderation, but I think it's a it's a it's a key issue in the context of COVID nineteen. And 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 first, it was the question whether the whole, whole epidemic is a hoax, uh, and now it's a question of the vaccines, where we see an, uh, a combination of correct factual information used for purposes of, of disinformation when speaking about vaccines and campaigning against people getting vaccinated. So I'd, I'd like to hear you first, and then I'll turn to the questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will start with your uh, uh, first question re regarding the state of emergency in the context of global pandemic and content moderation. 
So what we witnessed uh, throughout the global pandemic was definitely a heavier reliance on the use of automated tools for content, not only for content moderation, but also for content curation. So we tend to distinguish between these two due to the certain specificities of these tools. Um, uh, so one is about really how the content is being moderated. Another one is about how it's being distributed across the platform. Um, so these heavy reliance was, of course, caused due to the fact that they could not rely, uh, rely anymore on human moderators. Human moderators were prevented from actually, you know, uh, coming to their workplaces and content moderation is not exactly the type of work you can do from home if you work for a very large online platform, especially. Um, what we started, however, noticing is uh, that precisely those issues that we were already fully aware of and that I discussed uh, today, whether it's a contextual blindness and other shortcomings of automated tools became even more visible. And one of the main issues that we were noticing was, um, and this is something we are constantly grappling with when we are discussing to platform with platforms, is that the content that could have been actually specifically within the context of COVID-19, that could have been used for further research for us to understand perhaps how misinformation or disinformation related to this con to COVID-19 uh, spreads across the platforms, uh, so it could actually inform further research, was not always um, uh, stored by platforms or accessible for that purpose. We've been uh, asking for uh, 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 like storing this type of content and not to permanently deleting that type of content for quite some time now. And we made those requests uh, through different public letters addressed to platforms specifically in relation to COVID-19 content. Um, we also were pushing platforms to actually issue specific uh, metrics and information around right to appeal against those decisions that the platform made in the context of COVID-19 and specifically to that decision that was actually derived from automated decision making process. And we wanted the platform to specifically issue the transparency report that will tackle the period of COVID-19 global pandemic or somehow single out the actions that were actually taken in this particular uh, in this particular context, um, so I wouldn't say that a global pandemic brought about something new in terms of the use of automated decision making processes, but it simply emphasized the issue of content moderation at scale, which became which became even bigger as a consequence of these extraordinary uh, circumstances. There were other issues, however, specifically in the context of COVID-19 related disinformation and misinformation. And I'll gladly share our report that we published during this time, where we also have a specific chapter on the state of emergency and what is the international human rights framework for that emphasizing that the human rights do not cease to exist during this time. And we actually witnessed within the European Union very alarming behaviors, especially from, unfortunately, I again have to point a finger at those countries that are often being accused of democratic backsliding, uh, more towards essential Eastern borders of the European Union. And um, we saw how for instance, different forms of even misinformation. And because there is, there are, we distinguish in our work between misinformation, disinformation, and state-sponsored propaganda, which was extremely important, especially in the relation to COVID-19. And we rely heavily on the United Nations uh, scope of these definitions, uh, which were adopted, uh, I think, already in the, one of the joint declarations already back in 2018. Um, where uh, we saw states suddenly adopting uh, criminalization measures for these type of expressions that directly impacted also online expressions. And especially misinformation is often misleading statement with no intent to actually cause uh, uh, harm uh, in contrast to this information that can be also state sponsored. Uh, so we witnessed that also in Hungary, we witnessed that in non-European countries, uh, and this is the trend that constantly repeats itself uh, across the globe. Another issue that we were monitoring throughout this crisis was the access to effective information. Um, and I have to say that platforms also played uh, some important role in uh, actually promoting the content, for instance, from World Health Organization. 
trying to deploy different measures to bring into users' attention that you might be dealing with the content which is actually disinformation or that is not factually correct. Um, so we also need to give probably some credits to platforms for trying to help the cause. Um, and uh, in this case, they were not only perpetrator of abuse, um, and uh, uh, finally, uh, the final observation in the context of COVID-19 was how it became suddenly very obvious how disinformation can actually fuel other societal phenomena online, such as hate speech against certain groups that were for some reason more associated with the spread of the virus. Um, and uh, very often this was directly fueled by the statements of public figures and politicians on their Twitter accounts, for instance. So uh, based on the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we could actually conclude and our colleagues in the United States concluded as well that uh, politicians were one of the main perpetrators of online hate speech, um, precisely giving in into this uh, rhetoric, uh, which was completely misplaced. Uh, so that would be on this information. And of course, the contextual blindness of automated tools within the context of everything that was happening became even more obvious. Um, uh, and that goes also for ranking the content, for instance, which also the ranking has direct impact on the right to freedom of expression, even though there are some legislators in this world who think that if they focus on the amplification of the content, that's not the same right to freedom of expression. Well, it is. And uh, specifically during the COVID-19, we actually uh, monitored the case of TikTok, which claimed to protect uh, persons with disabilities against uh, harassment and bullying by de-ranking and deprioritizing the content they were posting, by which they effectively removed important platform and the voice from these community which already struggles with actually be having their say um, uh, within the world. And then uh, Madge actually also answered my question around disinformation, but what I would like to emphasize with disinformation, disinformation is a type of content which is approached within the EU as potentially harmful, but legal content. It's not the content that would be necessarily uh, considered to be illegal. Um, now, uh, this information very much falls into the scope of, for instance, European Democracy Action Plan that also will actually, uh, the, co the communication is published already in December, which also further explains better the relationship between that and Digital Services Act, but also there will be more initiatives coming from this umbrella of European Democracy Action Plan, such as specific sectoral legislation on political content or politically sponsored content and political advertisement. Uh, but precisely here, I think, uh, with at on one hand, transparency requirements and what the code of practice didn't get right, and which is currently happening because the code of practice is being revised as we speak. But at the same time, what role uh, content recommender systems and online targeting models play in the spread of information? Uh, and I would argue that significant one. Um, uh, and then we go back to the argument around the, echo, the attention economy and how exactly actually this amplification of potentially harmful but legal content happens, um, you know, or sensational content in general. Uh, but I think that that should be the main focus, at least within the DSA framework. Of course, there are so on and so forth that sh should be deployed by, uh, that should be explored further. But I think that specifically for this information, uh, the amplification is a uh, very, very important element and how this amplification happened and what are the elements and how we can actually inform a user that he or give that choice back to the users, whether by opt out by default, opt in by default, many other very practical measures. And the final element there would be, of course, the whole debate around interoperability, how to make these very large online platforms inter interoperable as much as the issue of data portability. Um, but there are much better experts than me to speak about that. Thank you, Eliska. Uh, I think you have addressed one of the questions in the Q&A, Q &A, which uh, pointed to the risk that in high 
uh, risk situations such as COVID-19, there will be specific forms of hate speech targeting minorities using your terminology who are by others associated as, as being uh, somehow responsible or carrying the virus. So that, that I think was addressed. There are three questions from one of the same person and the, the conceptual basis there is the question, as the platforms are private actors, they are private, private business actors who have a, have a legitimate right to maximize their business income. So who cares? How much can we put responsibilities on them? And should states develop their own platforms somehow detached from the state itself to, to have a public function? And how would we get the users to move to the pu public uh, platforms, pu publicly run platforms, in order to get around the question of, of a business profits as a, as a driver. And related to this group of questions, there's also issue of how do you see the role of international level of control mechanism, uh, monitoring of compliance, including with freedom of expression. So that was a cluster, I'd say. Over to you. I give you three minutes. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to be concise. Uh, so the the state-run platforms that that sounds very terrifying to me, <laughs> if I'm very honest. Um, I I I do hear and we often deal with the argument of economic profit and these are private actors and so on. But nevertheless, I think that the times where we could just look at uh, these platforms as uh, purely, uh, I mean, they are still very profit driven and that's pretty much their uh, main interest. And that's where the Aztec model actually lies ultimately. Mm -hmm. But the impact that they have on the society, on the democratic discourse, on people's human rights, and the role they play, especially in those parts of the world where we, for instance, use so-called, where people use zero rating applications, where there are countries where the only internet that they know is actually Facebook. Um, I don't think, and given the United Nations guiding principles on human rights, I don't think that we can purely treat them as private actors who can, for instance, use their business secret argument in order not to disclose information about systems that ultimately shape this public discourse. And that's why Digital Market Act proposal, for instance, referred to them as gatekeepers. Um, DSA uses its own, its own categorization, very much pointing out to the need of better regulation of these platforms because of the impact they have. So that would be a very quick and short answer to it. And I wouldn't definitely like to see a state-sponsored platform <laughs> that's, um, especially if I think about some countries that uh, where the rule of law and the protection of human rights is, to say the least, lagging behind. And the second question was related, I'm sorry, I think that I lost it, but uh, if you can remind me quickly, um, sorry, I don't know. A, a state-run platform doing a public service? Uh, that, that was the one, but the international human rights framework, so just about the state-run platforms, I think where the states should focus on is to properly enforce their positive obligation to protect individual human rights, even against the action of private actors. That's the number one. Stop shifting your own duties on private actors who will do it in the most possible non-transparent way. And uh, and then uh, definitely, if anything, states should do is to actually then enforce these laws in a way that they will provide enough capacity to the uh, bodies that can actually have that level of expertise. And when we speak about historically marginalized groups, for instance, equality bodies that if they have enough capacity and resources to conduct things like uh, independent audits or even human rights impact assessments, uh, looking specifically into data sets that these machine learning systems are being trained on, uh, which is of course far, far away future because right now we are absolutely not at that stage, but that would be already a significant step further. And international human rights framework, well, uh, Article 19 together with the former Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, David Kay, uh, were championing the idea of social media council, which would be a great counterpart to the current Facebook oversight board, for instance, which is exactly more of a self-regulatory body, which however, or co-regulatory, which however would consist of multiple actors from civil societies, 
uh, private actors as well, and somehow would be exercising a level of oversight over the operations of platforms specifically for their terms of service. Um, so that's still the idea that, uh, in my view, could definitely coexist next to some form of public oversight, but we have to see whether this will ever be uh, enforced in practice. I think. Okay, I still bother you with uh, two challenges come from the Q&A. One is about inclusion, it is about disability, but it's also a technological challenge. What about voice-based uh, platforms? How is content moderation going to be able to tackle those in an inclusive and non-discriminatory manner? And the second uh, question, uh, related only by the dimension of solidarity and inclusion is how would do we do we equip the global south not only with vaccines but also with the capacity to do content moderation and, and counter disinformation in the context of COVID-19. Those are the final questions to Eliska. Our time is soon up. Thank you so much. Uh, the first question is definitely extremely interesting and we've just actually sent uh, one of our very first letters to, I can name the platforms, right, uh, to, to Spotify, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure many of you are using uh, or we all do, I, I believe. Uh, and this was uh, actually in uh, together with the Union of Musicians and Allied Workers, which very much then uh, focused on calling on this company to actually make uh, a public commitment to never use, license, sell, or monetize its new speech recognition patent technology. Uh, so we actually sent the first letter already in April. Uh, we got some sort of response saying that they have never implemented this technology, uh, but we still had more demands and wanted them to actually uh, do a pledge uh, that they will stay away from anything that could uh, possibly result into automated monitoring of emotional state, which could be very handy for them, because based on that, they could do recommendations. Um, but of course, it would place the company into a very dangerous position of power. This directly results into gender discrimination, which we often see in the content moderation and curation practices. Uh, and especially against trans and non-binary people, because the intersectional discrimination is almost impossible for these two to to effectively tackle or recognize or identify, not even mentioning the privacy uh, uh, violations because in the device would, that where you actually have this app and that you use would be always on, uh, meaning it would be constantly monitoring, processing your voice data. And also um, it would probably likely uh, obtain very sensitive information. And the final aspect of these measures is the data security, of course. So again, harvesting people's data um, and that could then encourage state authorities or governments or other malicious hackers to abuse them and seek this information from the private company. So uh, it is still something uh, also very new to us. We started working on this issue this year, but I encourage you to check our website. And indeed, it's a prevailing issue where we can name precisely very similar negative impact on human rights as within the automation, uh, content moderation and content curation tool. And the final question about COVID-19 and the vaccination. Um, so how we can, if I remember correctly, it was about the capacity uh, and uh, how that content, I mean, I, I would answer it in a very, um, and I'm not sure whether I got a question right, but the current system as it is, it is definitely, I don't want to say it's, it's doomed to fail in many ways. Also, when we speak about the human content moderation, and then we have to also touch upon the issue of modern sweatshops and the labor conditions of content moderation and where content moderation actually takes place and where these human reviewers are based and what kind of training they actually have. And that opens another Pandora box of many issues. So not really answering your question, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's at least agreeing that there is a challenge. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and that's your job and that's our job to confront the challenges. I hand over to Matthias for a quick final comment on the discussion. Matthias, do you hear me?
You're muted, Matthias. My my connection is a little bit unstable, and I hope you you can all hear me. Uh, I... Hello. Are Matthias. you there? Go ahead. Hmm. I don't Are you think trying without you me? video? Just speak. We can hear you. Yes. I think we can hear you. Yes, I can. I there's I have some internet connection problems, uh, I think, but I just uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, it's time to close because I don't see you react and I can't see you as well. We do hear you, so you can make your comment. Well, I will, I will, I will just say that the, of course, this was a very interesting and, and enlightening uh, debate, of course, and I've, uh, I've fully agree with many of the points that uh, Eliska has uh, has raised here. I do think we are a very important um, uh, period of time here when it comes to the regulation of um, uh, online, online speech. And I think especially the way that Europe is contemplating to um, to regulate these new forms of, of, of online content is definitely a model that could be rolled out to many different and um, different parts of the world actually it's it's it really manages to um free the thin line between imposing more responsibilities on online platforms while preserving our own fundamental rights and and freedoms at uh, at the same time um just like one very minor comment on one of the last points that, that was raised um i do think there is some value in not really like state-based sort of sort of um or state-owned platform but i do think it's an interesting discussion to have that we need this sort of public interest internet infrastructure just in the same way that we, that we share and cherish and appreciate the BBC, for instance, in, in the UK, when it comes to having an, an a no broadcaster, I think this man to have something uh, in the online space because we don't have the equivalent of certain and spread credible uh, information in the online space. I think the work that the right First Amendment Institute at, at Columbia University is uh, sponsoring could be a really interesting um, um, direction to, uh, to follow, actually. I'll leave it at that, and I, I hope that was, uh, that was useful. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Eliska. Thank you both for being uh, with us today. I think it was a very good discussion, and we had a good uh, attendance of over 40 people all the time present. I hope the audience uh, got what they expected, and we were able to uh, at least raise some of the questions that, questions that came from the audience. Please register for next week's Bonavero discussion group session at the same time on Tuesday. And the theme will be mapping the way forward for human rights in Scotland. Scotland is in the headlines and they have taken uh, new steps to incorporate international human rights norms into their domestic law and there may be further challenges ahead. The uh, speakers will be Alan Miller and Hayley Hooper. So join us next week. Thank you very much for today. <laughs>